Benito Mussolini was the first of the new breed of dictators that came to power in the 1920s and 1930s. After his fascist party had seized power in the early 20s, Mussolini began to build up Italy's armed forces. Mussolini was not looking to fight another European war. Indeed, he would often play an important part in trying to keep the impossible peace in the run-up to World War II. No, the object of Italy's rapid industrialization and militarization was to be the acquisition of empire. Italy alone of the undefeated European powers entered the 1930s without a considerable empire. True, she controlled Libya and Eritrea in Italian Somaliland, but when compared to the vast imperial holdings of Britain and France, Italy was the poor man of Europe. For Mussolini, this would not do. The fascists derived their name from the Roman fascine, an axe with a bunch of wooden poles or logs tied to it. This was a symbol of a consul's authority during the Roman Republic. With this symbol as the emblem of his party, Mussolini was announcing to the whole world his intention to rebuild and recreate the Roman Empire. In order to recreate his new Roman Empire, Mussolini would need to conquer a new territory. And since neither Mussolini nor the Italian army was ready to attack a modern European country with a modern defence force, he would not be able to seize any of the territories from Britain and France. That left only one option. There was only one independent African state that did not have a colonial overlord at that time, and that was Ethiopia. Ruled by a Christian emperor, Ethiopia had so far avoided colonialization by a mixture of military prowess, isolation and diplomacy. As a member of the League of Nations, Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia had every reason to believe that the global community would stand up to aggression and guarantee his nation's sovereignty. For Mussolini, the choice was obvious. Since Italian Eritrea and Italian Somaliland already bordered the Ethiopian Empire, he already had the base from which to launch his invasion. Furthermore, the Ethiopians under Emperor Menelik II had administered a devastating defeat to the Italians in 1896. At the Battle of Adoa, thousands of Italians were killed when they tried to invade the Ethiopian Kingdom. With control over Italian Somaliland and Eritrea, the Italians were in a strong position militarily. The only complicating factor would be whether the British, then controlling Egypt and the Suez Canal, would allow the supplies and troop ships through for what was clearly a flagrant violation of a nation's sovereignty and international law. Mussolini, ever the bombast, threatened to open up a war across the Mediterranean if the British stopped his army from reaching Ethiopia. At the time, the British government was trying to appease the dictators of Europe whilst they built up their own dilapidated armed forces. What's more, the disunited and sometimes feudal nature of the Ethiopian Empire had little appeal at a time when European colonialism and spreading Western civilization were still popular sentiments in Britain. And so, with a feeble outcry and the threat of sanctions from the League of Nations, Mussolini began the invasion of Ethiopia in October 1936. So important was this crusade to the fascist movement that two of Mussolini's sons flew in bombers during the opening bombing barrage against the Doha. This was to be more than an invasion. This was a revenge for past defeats and an opportunity for future glory. Emperor Selassie, for his part, mobilized his patriotic and warlike fighters, many fighting underneath their own feudal lords, the Russes. A supreme warlord, Emperor Haile Selassie, Rastafari, King of Kings, the conquering Lion of Judea, claimed direct descendant from King Solomon of the Bible. But this was no clash between equals. The Italian army had hundreds of bomber aircraft, thousands of guns, tanks and modern material, as well as over 150,000 well-trained Eritrean Ascaris who had no love for Haile Selassie and his Ethiopians. Despite heroic resistance by the Ethiopians, their position was hopeless. Against unprotected villages, the Italians unleashed their bombers, sometimes carrying outlawed gas bombs, raining death on the civilians below. 
In early 1937, after personally leading his troops in battle, Emperor Haile Selassie had no choice but to flee as his army disintegrated around him, and the Italians and their Eritrean and Somalian Askaris closed in on his capital of Addis Ababa. Many areas of the country would never really be controlled by the Italians, and fighting against Ethiopian holdouts never really stopped. But for Mussolini, this was his great victory that he had promised his people, and they cheered for him in their millions. Ethiopia became Italian Abyssinia, and the conquerors set about stamping their mark on their own new colony. Although they made some notable achievements, it was not to last. Mussolini would soon try to replicate the feat of Italian arms in other theatres, and he would lose everything in the process. When Hitler invaded Poland in September 1939, Mussolini was outraged. He had played a major part in mediating the peace agreements of Munich in 1938. So for the first few months of the war, Mussolini did nothing, maintaining neutrality with both Britain and France. Yet when the French and British armies were defeated in June 1940, Mussolini was faced with a fantastic, or indeed terrible, choice. If he invaded British-held Egypt and the Sudan, now, and managed to force a British military collapse in North and East Africa to coincide with the expected British collapse against Germany on the home front, then he could, at a stroke, create a new, enormous Italian empire stretching from Libya to Kenya and possibly beyond. A golden opportunity like this was not to be missed. If he waited, he risked Britain and Germany concluding a separate peace that would allow Britain to retain her colonial possessions unchanged. On June 10, 1940, little over one week since the British evacuated their troops from Dunkirk, leaving behind all their heavy equipment, Mussolini declared war on France and Britain. It was a war that had long been feared and prepared for. The first side to strike a blow was the South African Air Force. War officially began at midnight on the 11th of June, by which time the Junkers Ju-86 bombers of No. 12 Squadron South African Air Force stationed in Kenya were already loading bombs and fuel onto their long-range aircraft. Originally designed as a long-range civilian airliner, the Ju-86 had been modified to carry a thousand pounds of bombs under its wings. At dawn on the 11th of June, the Junkers came in low over British Moyale, a frontier fortress defending Kenya from attacks to the north. Opposite the border was Italian Moyale. The airstrike achieved complete surprise and caused moderate damage. The Italians struck back three days later, bombing a number of British bases, ports and airfields in the area. The war for East Africa had begun. Mussolini ordered his two commanders, Marshal Graziani and the Duke of Aosta, to immediately go on the offensive. There were 250,000 Italian troops in North Africa and another 250,000 in East Africa, vastly outnumbering the British Commonwealth forces stationed there at the time. The Italian attack into Kenya began on July the 4th with the attack and later siege of British Moyale. This frontier fortress held a vital crossroads in an arid region. In fact, the climate and landscape played a larger role in limiting the size and scope of the Italian invasion than any particular British reaction. Between the fertile highlands of Kenya and the fertile regions of Ethiopia lay hundreds of miles of almost impassable desert strewn with millions of black lava rocks that lock in the ferocious heat and emit it back at anyone unfortunate enough to be nearby. Mussolini was of course counting on the British either being invaded or knocked out by the Germans in the coming months. If this happened, then he could capitalize on a British collapse and take over their colonies in North and East Africa. It was a fantastic gamble. Although the Italian forces outnumbered those of the British, they were in no way equipped to undertake a rapid, mobile advance. The Italians simply did not have enough trucks to transport their army and its supplies deep into enemy territory. Especially in East Africa, where many of their vehicles were old and worn out after years of service fighting against the Ethiopians. The likelihood of a highly mobile campaign was small. Nonetheless, the invasions went ahead. 
In both Kenya and Sudan, the Italians faced stiff resistance, but were able to overcome the frontier garrisons using heavy artillery and superior numbers. The Italians took heavy casualties. In Kenya, they advanced as far as Buna, 100 kilometers inside the country. In Sudan, they reached the railway junction at Kasala, where they dug in, unable to go any further due to lack of fuel and transport. In August, the Italians drove the British garrison out from British Somaliland, and it appeared that Mussolini's plan was working. The Battle of Britain was in full swing, and he anticipated a German invasion of the British mainland no later than September. With that in mind, he ordered his Libyan armies to invade British-held Egypt in September at the latest. In both cases, Mussolini had not counted on the bravery of British and South African airmen. For in Egypt, there was stationed a South African airman who was described by his comrades as a kind, friendly person with a fine sense of humor and a tolerant, humble nature, a true South African gentleman. This South African gentleman is the second hero of our series, Marmaduke Thomas St. John Pattel, known to his friends as Pat. Pat Pattel, in his short but heroic career, was destined to become the highest scoring British Commonwealth pilot of the Second World War. Born in Butterworth in the Eastern Cape on July the 14th, 1914, Pattel was the son of South African-born parents of English descent. Named after his grandfather Marmaduke, Pattel was from a family steeped in military service. As a child, he was academically gifted and a keen boxer and long-distance swimmer. He also had a firm interest in aviation and engines, graduating from Graham College in 1931. A year later, Pattel applied to the South African Air Force, who were training a total of three new pilots in 1933. One of 30 applicants, Pattel was rejected due to his lack of flying experience. Determined to rectify this weakness, he went to Johannesburg and began taking flying lessons. To fund his ambitions, he worked at a mining company, Sheba Gold Mine. In late 1935, he picked up a copy of the Johannesburg Star newspaper. In it was an advert by the Royal Air Force, which was offering five-year short service commissions for cadets throughout the empire. The Royal Air Force was expanding rapidly to meet the threat of fascism. There were far more flying opportunities there than with a minuscule South African Air Force. Pattel was assigned to RAF Presswick upon joining, and like Sailor Milan, did his basic training in the de Havilland Tiger Moth. Graduating with outstanding marks, he completed his training in early 1937. He was rated as exceptional in his final report. Pattel then joined No. 80 Squadron, RAF, and began flying the Gloucester Gladiator in May that year. Learning his trade in mock battles against RAF Bomber Command, Pattel developed his own air tactics. He preferred attacking from a higher altitude than his quarry, before rolling over and diving to attack the target at extreme close range to make sure of him hitting it. His qualities as a flyer were well recognized, being promoted to pilot officer in July 1937. In 1939, Pattel accompanied 80 Squadron to Egypt, where they were tasked with defending the Suez Canal. Pattel's first targets were ground attack missions against Arab rebels who were fighting against British rule. More promising targets were soon on their way. Following Italy's declaration of war, 80 Squadron flying Gloucester Gladiators moved up to the Libyan border in anticipation of Italian air attacks. First seeing action in August, Pattel and his flight were escorting a western Lysander when they were engaged by a force of breeder ground attack aircraft escorted by six CR-42 fighters. In the ensuing combat, Pattel damaged a fighter but was soon attacked by his enemy's colleagues. Skillfully outmaneuvering them, Pattel managed to get in a few bursts before the guns on his gladiator jammed. Unable to fight back, Pattel managed to outfly his attackers for another 15 minutes before eventually his rudder controls were shot away by Italian air ace Franco Lucin, who had numerous victories in the Spanish Civil War. With his plane unflyable, Pattel climbed to 400 feet and bailed out. Having landed safely, he started walking towards Allied lines, disoriented in the desert. It was two days before he was found. Pattel was annoyed. He considered being shot down by the Italians as a slight on his honor, 
Determined to avenge himself and make sure he never got lost in the desert again, he bought a quality compass in Alexandria and never flew again without it. Eager for vengeance, Pattle was soon back in the air, shooting down two Fiat fighters whilst leading his section in a surprise attack inside Italian territory on September the 3rd. Pattle was soon promoted to flight lieutenant. The Italian ground invasion of Egypt began as planned in September to coincide with the hoped-for invasion of Britain by Germany. Unable to win air superiority, Hitler had to postpone and eventually cancel his invasion. Mussolini went ahead anyway. Much to the disgust of Pat Pattle and his comrades in 80 Squadron, they spent the most of the next month engaged in ground attack missions against the Italians. For purebred fighter pilots like Pat Pattle, it was a waste of their talents and potential. In October, the squadron withdrew to the Nile to recruit with Gladiator Mark IIs, but before they could, Mussolini's ambitions would again change the whole strategic situation. The Italian invasion of Egypt had proceeded well initially, with outnumbered British units giving ground rather than risk battle. The British general in charge in Egypt, Archibald Wavell, had decided to make his stand at Sidi Barani, some 200 kilometers inside Egypt, where the terrain would favor the defender. So in October 1940, with his armies in Egypt crawling along the Egyptian coast, Mussolini decided one more campaign would make him master of the Mediterranean. He decided to invade Greece. The Greeks, who up until now had managed to remain neutral in the war, suddenly found themselves firmly in the Allied camp. Churchill was eager to help them fend off the Italian invasion. Among the first British servicemen to arrive in Greece was Pat Pattle and the rest of 80 Squadron, who were withdrawn from Egypt and sent to Greece. It was here, during the Battle of Greece, a battle most Allied historians would rather forget, that the name Pat Pattle would become legend. In November, the squadron moved to Athens and set up station at Eleusis, north of the capital. Pattle, now flying a gladiator Mark II, was eager for combat against the Italians. He did not have long to wait. On November the 19th, Pattle and his flight attacked Italian fighters and bombers near the Italian airfield at Corce. Pattle claimed two of the nine Italian aircraft destroyed in the sortie. Later in the month, Pattle made four more claims, flying as escort for Bristol Blenheim bombers. Pattle engaged three SM-79s and shared two destroyed with 11 other pilots who all got in bursts. December 1940 was a bad month for Mussolini. In many ways, it was the beginning of the end for Il Duce. His Egyptian invasion had literally run out of steam, or more accurately, petrol. His massive army had advanced all the way from Libya along the one coastal road available. With all supplies and fuels coming down a single track, the army lost momentum and dug in. Marshal Graziani, in charge of the invasion, was awaiting a new fuel pipeline to be laid from Libya before continuing his advance towards Cairo and the Suez Canal. In the meantime, his army dispersed into five fortified camps whilst they awaited fresh supplies. The British were not going to give them the time they needed, however, and in a brilliant campaign beginning in December, the British attacked and overran each of the five fortified Italian bases, taking nearly 40,000 prisoners. The remaining Italian units retreated back towards the Libyan border, with the British in hot pursuit. In Greece, the Greek army put up fanatical resistance, eventually halting the Italian forces with heavy losses. They then counter-attacked, driving the Italians out of Greece and into Albania, which Mussolini had occupied the previous year. And in the air, one name was on everyone's lips, Pat Paddle. By the end of December, Paddle had shot down 14 Italian aircraft, resulting in him being awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. On the 9th of February, Paddle shot down his 15th victim, his last in the Gloucester Gladiator. Ten days later, number 80 Squadron was re-equipped with a newer Hawker Hurricane, on the day of the conversion, Paddle was leading a force of hurricanes on a bomber escort mission, when he led the attack against the circling Italian fighters. Using his usual tactics of getting very close before opening fire, he was not used to the awesome firepower of an 8-gun hurricane. The Italian fighter simply exploded before his eyes. A week later, he had claimed another in the hurricane, his 17th confirmed kill. The next day, British pilots in Greece celebrated their biggest success in combat. Number 80 Squadron claimed 27 Italian fighters in 90 minutes of combat, paddled down three aircraft in less than three minutes. 
This aerial victory coincided with the large-scale British reinforcements arriving in Greece. Churchill was determined to gain a foothold in Europe, from where he could take the war to Hitler and Mussolini. It was a threat Hitler could not leave unanswered, not when he knew that the bulk of the German armed forces were soon to be fighting the Russians deep inside the Soviet Union. No, he would have to act. He would secure his southern flank, defend the Romanian oil fields and rescue his faltering ally, even if it meant postponing the invasion of the Soviet Union by over a month. With his score standing at 21 victories, Pat Pattel was promoted to squadron commander of No. 33 Squadron on the 12th of March. Leading his men from the front, Pattel soon had the squadron whipped into shape, insisting on high standards of dress, flying and discipline from his pilots. By the middle of the month, he had been awarded a bar to his DFC. By the end of March, Pattel's score was 25, with pilots across the theatre awed by his aggression and determination. Roald Dahl, who would later become a famous author, was himself flying hurricanes in Greece at that time. He would say this of Pattel, and I quote, Now Pat Pattel was a legend in the RAF. At least he was a legend around Egypt and the Mediterranean. He was far and away the greatest fighter ace the Middle East was ever to see. With an astronomical number of victories to his credit, he was the ace of aces. End quote. When Hitler began the German invasion of Greece on April the 6th, 1941, Pattel would be faced with an entirely new enemy, flying aeroplanes with greater performance than his own, led by the world's greatest air aces. He was up for the challenge. With the majority of the Greek army facing the Italians in Albania, there was little to resist the German blitzkrieg that erupted out of Bulgaria. It fell to the RAF to try and stem the tide. Pattel led his fighters against the Germans again and again, scoring victories against both Luftwaffe fighters and bombers. By the 10th of April, Pattel's score stood at 33, making him the highest scoring ace in the RAF. Pattel's successes in the air were overshadowed by events on the ground, however. The German Wehrmacht broke through the Greek defences and would be in Athens within two weeks. Pattel fought like a man possessed throughout the early weeks of April downing German and Italian aircraft left and right. On two occasions he downed five aircraft in a day. He was, as Roald Dahl would later say, like a cat who had used up his, all his nine lives. On the 19th of April, Pattel developed a high fever and temperature. Nevertheless, he took to the skies, flying multiple missions and downing six aircraft. With the Germans fast approaching the capital, the RAF was putting up a desperate defense of Athens. Over 30,000 British troops would have to be evacuated before the Panzers closed in. The ships began to arrive and evacuate the first British troops back to the island of Crete. The 20th of April would be the critical day to evacuate the majority of the troops. On the 20th of April, the British began to evacuate their units from Athens. It was to be another Dunkirk, but unlike then when the entire fighter command was a short flight away, now the RAF could only put up 15 hurricanes to cover the evacuation ships. The Germans were aware that the British were withdrawing their troops and put together a substantial Luftwaffe operation against their ships and meagre force of RAF defenders. Pattel flew several patrols that day whilst his fever and infection worsened. At 5 o'clock in the afternoon, an air raid warned of 100 Luftwaffe bombers with fighter escorts heading towards the harbour. Pattel was last seen in the mess, lying on a couch, shivering under his blankets with fever. When the alarm was sounded, he rushed to his hurricane. His adjutant tried to stop him, but Pattel was determined to fly. Narrowly missing being strafed by a BF-110 on the way to his aircraft, Pattel took off and headed to the harbour. Arriving to find other hurricanes already in action, Pattel noticed a hurricane foolishly attack a formation of BF-110s that had a height advantage. Pattel dived in to try and rescue the Hurricane and shot down the BF-110, but it had already shot down its victim. Pattel's nine lives had been used up, however, and in the ensuing combat with the remaining BF-110s, he was shot down and killed. He was last seen slumped over his controls, with flames engulfing his aircraft as it crashed into the sea. Roald Dahl, who was also in the air that hectic day, records that of the 15 Hurricanes the RAF put up, five were shot down, 
with four pilots dying, one of them being Pat Patel. In his short but heroic career, Marmaduke Thomas Patel had 47 confirmed enemy kills, with many more probables never confirmed in the hectic days following the fall of Greece. Historians maintain Patel may have downed between 50 to 60 aircraft. As it is, 47 confirmed aerial kills still ensures Pat Patel is recognized as the highest scoring RAF ace of all time and the highest scoring pilot of the Western Allies. His nearest rival, Richard Bong of the United States Army Air Force, shot down 40 Japanese aircraft in the Pacific. But so brief was his career that he was never able to receive any of the medals he had been awarded. His distinguished flying crosses were awarded by the Governor General to his father. Being from a military family steeped in a tradition of duty, his father would say this of his heroic son, quote, 